Hi, my name is Daniel Rothenberg. Uh, I'm a professor of practice in the School of Politics and Global Studies at Arizona State University. And I also co-direct the Center on the Future of War and our larger future security initiative that links ASU with New America, uh, where I'm a senior fellow. Uh, in addition, I co-direct the online MA in Global Security. We're now in our fifth year with the program. It's a professional program that allows students from all around the world to take our classes. We have about 175 students now. About half are currently in the military or are veterans. About 40% are minorities. About a third are women. Uh, we'll have a little video about that program. And I'm really proud to welcome all of you here today and to introduce General John J. Raymond, who's the Chief of Space Operations for the United States Space Force. And he'll be joined in conversation by Dr. Warren Singer, a strategist and senior fellow at New America, as well as a professor of practice with us at Arizona State University. And he'll be moderating a conversation, what is the future of conflict in space? To better understand future international security challenges, Arizona State University, one of the largest and most innovative public research universities in the country, joined forces with New America, a creative and dynamic civic institution and think tank. Our work together led to the creation four years ago of the online master's degree in global security. The interdisciplinary degree links serious ideas with practical policy-oriented applications to aid professional advancement in the military, government, non-governmental organizations, and the private sector. Students can pursue the security studies degree from anywhere in the world, study while working, and finish in a calendar year. What makes the Master of Arts in Global Security so valuable is our commitment to working closely with each of our students to help realize their goals, as well as our faculty who bring a wealth of intellectual and practical expertise to the program's diverse course offerings. To learn more about ASU's online global security degree, visit asuonline.asu.edu. So I'm Peter Singer, and it is my pleasure to um, welcome you back to this uh, conference and lead a discussion on the future of conflict in space. And we could not have a better um, leader and expert to take us through this topic than General John W. J. Raymond, who is Chief of Space Operations with the United States Space Force. General Raymond was commissioned uh, through the ROTC program at Clemson University, uh, Go Tigers. And since then, he has commanded at every level, squadron, group, wing, numbered air force, major uh, command, combatant command, including uh, deploying to Southwest Asia as director of space forces in support of operations enduring freedom and Iraqi freedom. And so General, thank you very much for joining us today for this conversation. Well, Peter, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So obviously a important anniversary um, animates uh, this event, 9-11. Can you um, take us back to what you were doing on that day and how has that experience informed the way that you see the world now? I sure will. First of all, again, let me just say thanks and thanks to everybody that's uh, joining in with us uh, this afternoon. I did go to Clemson. I call that the Harvard of the South. But, uh, uh, you know, I, so I've been in the Air Force uh, since 1984 is when I graduated uh, from Clemson University. Uh, as I reflect back on 9-11, on uh, I was a lieutenant colonel. I had just given up squadron command, um, and I had moved to Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado Springs. I was what we call a deputy ops shooter commander. It was interesting. Uh, we were in the middle of an inspector general investi or, uh, inspection, and uh, uh, had had as an exercise been in higher states of readiness when the first plane hit the tower. And uh, and then when the second plane hit the tower, the second tower, uh, basically what we did was we took exercise off the board and put real world uh, on, and we just kept going without missing a beat. Uh, uh, it's a, like all of us, it's something that I'll never forget. Uh, uh, what it did though for me, if you look back, if, as I think back on it, you know, the first 
as a space officer on in uh, we considered Desert Storm uh, back in the, in 1991 to be kind of the first space war. I actually believe the Cold War was actually the first space war, but but it's really the first world war where we took space capabilities and we integrated. Uh, so back in, in in 1991, the very first use of GPS to help navigate, uh, we used big strategic satellites to detect small scud missiles, and and we saw the benefits of that integration and. Uh, Largely uh, from then, but, but specifically after 9/11, as we continued operating in the in the Central Command AOR, we have really matured uh, matured that focus to be able to take space capabilities and integrate those capabilities into everything that we do as a joint and combined force. Uh, and there's nothing that we do uh, that isn't enabled by space. I saw that firsthand when I deployed, and when I when I came home from that deployment. A lot of my friends asked me, well, what's the one thing that warfighters need uh, from space? And, and what I walked away from was there's not one thing. Space is enabled. Uh, every part of space is, is enabling operations. Uh, just like space enables our way of life uh, for, for our nation and, and for our allies and partners, the average American you know, uses space uh, multiple times before they have the first cup of coffee. And so space is both absolutely critical. Uh, access to space and freedom to maneuver in space is absolutely critical uh, to our way of life, and it's absolutely critical uh, to our way of war that's largely been developed and matured since 9-11. So the theme of this conference is looking back 20 years, but also looking forward 20 years. And so I'd love Just to hear... Like space. It enables our way of life uh, for, for our nation and for our allies and partners. The average American, I can't hear you, Peter. All right. I, do you hear me again? What I was saying is that the theme of this conference is looking back 20 years, but also looking forward 20 years. Could you um, tell me about what you believe the uh, chief of space operations will uh, look like? in the year 2041. Um, let's break this up into a couple of parts. How were they trained and developed? What was the flow of their careers? What would be similar to your background and maybe what would be different? I, yeah, I, I sure will. Kind of relates a little bit to the question that you, you first asked me. Uh, so when I, I think about where I was uh, 20 years ago today for 9-11, I had just graduated from squadron command. And so the chief of space operations for in, 19, in uh, 2041 will have grown up for the vast majority of her or his career uh, in the Air Force to, uh, that, at that point. I mean, they've done probably 15 to 17 years of, of being a space operator in the United States Air Force. And, and here over the last 20 something months uh, has been a, a member of the, of the, the new United States Space Force. And so as I, as I reflected on this, I, I look at, you know, Hap Arnold. And if you look at Hap Arnold uh, 20 years before um, he became the, the chief of staff of an independent Air Force, he was a squadron commander doing air observation. It was an air observation squadron. And if you look at where I was 20 years ago, I was a, a, a squadron commander doing space observation. It was a space surveillance squadron. And largely, as I just talked about uh, in the in our first uh, question, uh, we have largely been focused on integrating space into everything that that we do as a joint and in, in coalition force, and it's largely been done uh, uh, facing an adversary that doesn't have any space capabilities. Uh, I mean, um, it, there was not a big space threat, if you will, for the in, in our operations that that um, we've been undertaking. Again, going back to your first question, since since 9-11. What has happened, though, is uh, p potential adversaries or competitors have watched how we have integrated space in this benign domain, and they have seen the advantage that that provides us. And they're rapidly uh, doing two things. One, they're building capabilities for their own use uh, to, be, to have that same advantage. And two, building capabilities to deny us our access to space. And so that's why we stood up uh, an independent space force to... To, while, to take an opportunity while we're still the best in the world in space to have a, 
uh, service that comes to work every day dedicated on this warfighting domain. So going back to the question then, this, this Space Force Chief of 2041 will have been in the Air Force, will have uh, the foundational part of their career will have been spent integrating space uh, into operations. And here over the last couple of years, really beginning to mature the thought of space as a, as a warfighting domain and an independent view of space power uh, co-equal with all the other services. And so just as the Air Force went from uh, largely being a supporting service to the ground um, the ground forces and, and, and maritime forces, uh, space, which is still largely a supporting service, will also uh, develop uh, independent options to be able to, to compete, to turn and win with uh, great uh, powered uh, competitors that we see today and into the future. Can you tell me about the decisions that they might be making in this future? I'm thinking about everything from the grand strategy all the way down to the way that they apportion out their day, the day-to-day decisions. What will be um, similar to your day-to-day and your strategic thinking? And what might be different, say, 20 years out and how they spend their day and also the larger challenges that they face? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that, um, going back a little bit to one of the aspects of the question that you asked last time, how, how will the, you know, what will their career look like? Um, you know, in the 20 years from now until when they become a, a service chief, um, we hope to instill a, again, a better and deeper understanding of this new warfighting domain. I think we want to instill in them a, a, a deeper understanding of deterrence, because I really believe that that space um, uh, plays will play a significant role in, in ability to deter to, to, to deter conflict from either beginning or extending in the space. Or and if we can do that well, uh, spilling over into into other domains. I think that the Space Force Chief will also be a a global uh, somebody with a global view. Uh, our domain requires that. It's not, you can't split that domain up into little pieces. It, it, it requires, and it's one of the strengths that a space professional brings to the brings to the fight. The other thing that I think uh, this professional will have to have is we'll have to have a broader and deeper understanding of all the different sectors of space, whether it be uh, national security space, uh, international space, commercial space, and civil space. Uh, we all operate in the same domain. Uh, and the and the challenges that we see you know, going forward with space becoming way more congested than what it is today, with significant numbers of of capabilities being lost, way more competitive with pretty much every aspect of space having a commercially viable uh, path now as technology has gotten uh, smaller, technologies become uh, more relevant, uh, and and I see it becoming even more contested uh, as well as we go forward. So the so what are the decisions then with, with that kind of as a, as a setting the stage for what those folks are going to have to develop here over the next 20 years? I think, uh, first of all, they're going to have to, they're going to have to continue the dialogue with what is, what's the role of national security space as an independent uh, uh, service operating in a, in a domain that can provide independent options for our decision makers. I think some of the decisions that the Space Force Chief of 2041 is going to have to figure out is um, what is, how do you, how best to deter. Our goal is not to, not to, I repeat, not to get into a conflict that begins or extends into space. It, it is to deter that. And so I think there's going to have to be a level of understanding of deterrence. And I think there's going to have to be decisions on escalation control, what's hostile intent, what are rules in the ga- of engagement. As we mature this warfighting domain, all of those things are going to be uh, part of the calculus that they're going to have to face. The other thing I get asked all the time when people hear about the Space Force, they think, you know, we're up. Um, uh, fighting aliens in the in the domain, which clearly is not uh, the, our mission. But I do sense as space as 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 our as humans, and we we uh, begin to go beyond uh, Earth into what some call you know a kind of a multi planet species. And as we see, you know, just here in about three days, we're going to NASA is going to launch three uh, or launch a uh, a rocket that has four commercial. Uh, astronauts on it with no NASA astronauts, no military astronauts on there. Just four uh, civilians are going to go 
orbit around the, the Earth uh, for astronauts on it with no military astronauts uh, for, for three days before coming back. And I do see there's going to be more of a human presence in space, which then brings into mind what is the role of the military in securing that domain to allow uh, economic development, to allow um, uh, exploration, uh, and to allow stability very similar, very analogous to what the Navy does today in the maritime domain with maintaining security so so the sea lines of communication are, are free uh, and able to be exploited. And so um, I, I believe all those things uh, will be decisions or, or things that will be on the plate of a, of a service chief in 2041. And as I, had, as I had thought about that question, what I realized was 2041 is not that long, it's not that far away. Uh, and as I reflected back, I was a squadron commander. I mean, that's a relatively senior officer in the military. And so it's, it's not as far as it seems when you just hear 2041. I want to take your um, answer and, and flip it. Um, you asked, you know, what is the role of the military in security and space in this future? But you also talked about the growing um, civilian commercial role in space, both independently, but um, also increasingly as, as a partner to the military. What is the responsibility of these new civilian commercial um, partners, providers in space uh, when it comes to the security side? I'm thinking, for example, um, do they have to meet the same um, cyber uh, resilient standards that we've seen in the traditional defense economy? What is their role and responsibility when it comes to the security side? Yeah, so first of all, I, you know, one of the things that we're thinking through today, and, and uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful by 2041 that this will, will have got some rules in, in place, but kind of what are the norms of behavior? You know, no matter if you're a civil agency or a commercial agency or a national security agency uh, operating in space, we all operate in the same domain. Uh, that domain is going to become more congested, more competitive, more contested. Uh, and we have to figure out what are what are safe and professional, um, uh, what is safe and professional as it relates to the space domain, like we have on the air, in the air domain and in the maritime domain. What are, what are the norms of behavior? What what do we say uh, is appropriate on how to have uh, relates to the space domain? Like, hey, uh, it is going to be even more so uh, critical as as this domain continues continues to change. And so, I think there has to be a level of you know, we're all going to operate uh, in a safe and professional manner to keep the domain safe for all. And I think all all segments of space have a role in that. Um, I think if you look at um, how we work very closely with the commercial industry. There are clearly things that, that uh, uh, we've partnered with, uh, for example, uh, commercial satellite communications. We, we rely very heavily on commercial satcom. Um, do, well, do I think that those capabilities need to be able to operate in a, in a contested domain? Uh, I would say yes. That's the way the domain is going. So I do think there's, there are things that commercial industry and, and and civil space are going to have to do. But I think if I were to bring it all down to, to one thing, I would say we have to develop some norms of behavior and rules of the road and how to operate. Let's talk strategy. Um, you have uh, in other forums laid out a vision of, quote, defend, shift, punch. What does that mean? Well, so the capabilities that we have on orbit today are were largely built. Uh, you know, we, we've been involved in space business for for fifty years you know, since the beginning of you know back when space was really great power competition between us and the Soviet Union. And the capabilities that we have today are the, are the world's best, uh, world's best. Uh, but they're they're really designed for a different domain. It, they weren't designed for a domain that we see today, which again is is congested and, and contested and, and competitive. And so we need to make, so first of all, we need to make sure that uh, because we are so reliant on capabilities, uh, both as a nation and as a joint and coalition force, we need to be able to protect the capabilities that we have today. And we need to train operators to be able to operate those, uh, operate those uh, capabilities through uh, in, in a contested environment. We need to develop tactics, techniques, and procedures. We need to develop partnerships 
there's all kinds of things that we need to do to be able to, to defend uh, those capabilities uh, that we have. And then um, we need to shift to a more defendable architecture. I think we've got great opportunities here. If you look at what's going on in the space domain today with uh, with commercial industry, I mean, we, we, all, we have all seen um, uh, what, what historically has been commercially viable in space are large communication satellites and, and uh, launch vehicles. And we've seen that. We've seen uh, Blue Origin you know, launch Jeff Bezos in orbit. We've seen Rich, uh, Virgin Orbit launch uh, Richard Branson into space. We, we, uh, and and uh, we've seen uh, Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit launch payloads into space. We've seen SpaceX uh, and the success that they've had in launching satellites and returning uh, first stage boosters. I mean, we we have all uh, seen that uh, seen that taking place, and and I believe uh, that that um, we have an opportunity to capitalize on that. We, what is not quite as visible is the shift towards what's being called a proliferated low Earth orbit architecture, and that's you know, what space provides uh, from geosynchronous orbit is persistence because the Earth uh, rotates the same speed that the satellite is orbiting. Uh, in low Earth orbit, you don't get that persistence. So you get that persistence by adding numbers. And so you'll see, you know, SpaceX, for example, with their Starlink constellation providing global internet uh, from space um, has, I, I think, upwards now of over 1,700 satellites, where just two years ago, a year and a half ago, they had zero. And so you're seeing a significant uh, increase in the number of, of capabilities. They're smaller, they're more responsive, they're cheaper, they're being innovative. We want to be able to capitalize on that. And, and I think uh, there's opportunities there. And I think there's also opportunities. Space provides an opportunity to, to, to continue to build global partnerships. And uh, we're working really hard uh, to develop those partnerships with our international partners. Uh, in fact, I just hosted a, uh, a chief's meeting of service chiefs from around the world that, that are responsible for their space capabilities and had 22 different uh, chiefs come to this conference in every continent with the exception of Antarctica. And so we're really developing these global partnerships that will be so important to us. Uh, and we think there's a huge opportunity there as well. So I want to um, remind our audience that you can submit questions uh, and we'll um, wrestle with those as well. The protocol for it is there should be a box towards the right of your video where you can um, submit it. Uh, if that doesn't work for you, you can also email them to events at newamerica.org. Again, that is events at newamerica.org. Uh, so general, um, there is, it's arguable, no other service has such an um, explicit connection to technology as um, the Space Force. It probably would have previously been said Air Force, but now definitely the Space Force. When um, you gather with those other uh, space leaders, what technology is the one that um, is most exciting? that um, people believe is the most potentially game-changing for the next 20 years as we look out at the future. And then um, I want to layer a second question onto that. What technology um, do you think we get most wrong about? Um, it may be the same or maybe a different one. So what's the most exciting, most game-changing? What do we get most wrong? Yeah, from a technology side, and this is Jay Raymond's you know, personal opinion from a technology side, um, I think there's a couple things that are really exciting to me in it, and it leads into something that isn't a technology uh, benefit, but I'll, I'll highlight that as well. Um, I think that there's two things that really are exciting. One is the, 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 the advances in technology that has allowed for uh, payloads to be much smaller, kind of microelectronic types of things that used to be, you know, payloads that used to be the size of dishwashers that are now being, now can be accomplished in the size of a softball. Uh, and that allows uh, more uh, capabilities to be put into space. It allows uh, it to be done uh, more cheaply. It allows it to be done more innovatively uh, and more responsibly. Um, and so I think that, that, is a significant, a significant uh, 
uh, maturing uh, of technology that's going to continue. I think the other big piece of this then is compute power and the ability to make sense of all that data and all that information that's going to come from space. Today, you know, we get vast amounts of data uh, and uh, it's going to be dwarfed by the data that we're going to be able to get in the future. Now that we're going to have many, many more sensing uh, capabilities that will be up there. And that if, if we can harness the computing power then to, to uh, um, extract answers to really tough problems from that data, I think those are two things that, that I'm really excited about. The reason, the other piece of this, which isn't a technology advantage, but it enables a new business model. It enables, you know, today our satellites are very exquisite uh, and, and they're the world's best. Uh, they're they're not cheap, and they're not something that we can procure overnight. They take time to 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 uh, acquire, and because of that, you really want to put a lot of mission assurance on it, which then uh, drives more increased costs and increased timelines. Uh, because you can't take the risk of failure. It's, you can't you don't get a do over if you launch something into space and it doesn't work. You can't go up there and bring it back down and say let's try again. And so. If you change the business model to allow for an assembly line approach, uh, you then can make different risk calculus, uh, have different risk calculus and make different decisions. And so I think it also enables more partners, uh, more commercial partners and more international partners to participate with you. And so I think the, the, the advances made in, in electronics that allows payloads to be smaller, the ability to reap uh, and, and, and um, extract data uh, with computing power uh, will be beneficial, but it will help. Uh, it will really help us uh, adopt a new business model. And it's probably not a one size fits all business model. I think it's more of a hybrid. I think we're going to have have exquisite capabilities, but I think there's also going to be a robust uh, set of capabilities that aren't exquisite, but they're operational good enough. Uh, on the what do I think we have wrong? I don't. I don't. Wouldn't say. Um, it's wrong. I would say, our, like I said, our capabilities are the best in the world, um, but they're built for a different domain. And the challenge is I can't go to the nation and say, hey, I'm going to turn off GPS. I'm going to turn off communication satellites. I'm going to turn off missile warning satellites. And I'm going to turn off uh, ISR satellites. And I'll come back to you in you know, five to 10 years with new capabilities. You got to have a bridging strategy to develop those capabilities that are built for the domain. And I, I that's where we're headed is, is building uh, strategies to, to move to a different architecture, if you will, uh, that is purpose built for the domain that we find ourselves in today. It's interesting you know, on both your last answer and as you connect it to the um, question of compute power, you know, everybody wants to focus on the scenario of um, AI, super intelligence, uh, lethal weapon systems and the like, and arguably um, a much more important application, uh, kind of more game changing is helping to solve the, the so-called um, salesman problem, uh, letting you know exactly what to pack and where exactly to stop on your route. So you get this entire new market and efficiency. Um, it's not as sexy, but it's actually maybe more important to both business and then its application to war fighting. Um, let's uh, take that a little bit further. Um, one of the other things that you've continually stressed is um, speed. Uh, you constantly talk about speed in your speeches. Tell me, um, what do you want to go faster? What do you mean when you're continually stressing speed? I, I would, I, um, as I look back to General Bernard Schreiber back, who's the kind of the father of DOD space, that's, you know, back in the 50s, really we developed the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Program and, and some of our strategic satellite programs. And if you look at the timelines that they were able to develop uh, these capabilities on, they were very, very fast. Uh, I think the entire ICBM fleet was designed and implemented uh, in, a, in less than five years. Uh, today, if, if I wanted to buy or procure a, a, a clone of a GPS satellite, exactly like the satellite that we have on orbit today, that, that itself takes about five years. And so uh, I think the reason why is we've had the luxury of time. Uh, you know, and today we don't have that luxury. Our competitors are moving very fast. And so what I when I say we need to go fast, we need to... Uh, we built in the Space Force a new capability development construct 
Uh, and it's everything from what's, what's the appropriate force design uh, to requirements and how do you do requirements uh, quicker? And then how do you acquire those capabilities at the speed of relevance? And then how do you test those capabilities uh, to make sure that you have, you know, you're delivering what you need and then you know, do that uh, cycle over again. And so that capability development cycle is something that, that we're working hard on to, to, to address all aspects of, of getting a capability from an idea to an on-orbit capability uh, in a time frame that, that we need based on what we're seeing our competitors do in the domain. If you look at commercial industry, um, and I'll use one example, uh, but there's multiple examples out there, but I saw this firsthand. I went, I went to SpaceX back in, um, uh, not this past January, but January before, and I visited their, their satellite factory, their Starlink factory, and it was an empty room. And uh, they told me, you know, we got to design our satellites and we're going to build this factory. Then we're going to have an assembly line and then we're going to build satellites and then we're going to integrate them on a launch vehicle and launch them. Four months later, they, they launched 60 satellites. So they designed the satellites, they, they built the factory, they built the satellites, integrated them on a launch vehicle. Um, we want to, again, the business model that they have uh, allows them to do that. And as I talked about in the answer to the earlier question, if we can change the design of our force structure to enable that business model to be successful uh, for national security space, we would like to be able to take advantage of that. I think that's, when I talk about going fast, that's, that's what I'm really talking about. So before we turn it over to the audience for Q&A, I want to ask one last question, and it's to actually take us back to um, when we were talking about um, the difference between uh, and the similarities between your role and training and background today and that uh, CSO of 2041. Um, what is something that you spend too much of your time on right now? something that is um, occupying your time or is incredibly challenging that you hope is solved by 2041? And how is that solved? Um, so that's, that's a nice softball question to answer that to end the conversation with. But I, there's a couple of things that come to mind. Uh, first thing is, um, and this will be solved by 2041. I hope this is solved here in the next couple of years, uh, but we've, uh, we're building a service. And so, you know, when we, when, when the National Defense Authorization Act was signed back in December of 19, it says, and I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing here, but it said effective immediately or upon signature, you know, now the Space Force is up. And so what the Air Force had, had thought about was uh, when this law was signed, we were going to spend about 18 months planning. Uh, and then we were going to really kick off. And if that was the case, I'd be sitting here with you today saying, you know, um, just a month ago, we started. And, and if you look now at what we've done over the last course of the last 18 or 19 months, we've, we've built all the personnel processes to bring to bring people into the service. And if you look at the people that we're, that we're attracting, it's, they're incredibly talented folks. And we have way more people knocking on our door wanting to come in than, than we have slots for. We've completely reorganized national security space. Uh, we have written our first doctrine. We've done two budgets. Um, we have started doing things like seals and flags and mottos and, and uh, uniforms and all those things that that hopefully will, songs and all the things that go with being an independent service. Hopefully, uh, all of those which which designing a service. And when we went back to you know the Hap Arnold days in 1947 and said let's let's get his checklist on how we build a service, it didn't exist. And so. We've been driving the car, operating national security space and building the Space Force at the same time, all under a global pandemic. And I couldn't be more proud of the team if you look at uh, the advances that, that we have made. Um, so that, that's one. I think that just the building of the Space Force, and we're already seeing that we've got all the major muscle movements now, all the major building blocks in place. And, and uh, that's that's really, uh, really important. The other big piece, and one of the reasons why Congress wanted to uh, Establish an independent service uh, was that there was they they identified there were sixty different organizations in the DoD that that had their hands in space um, and um, now that we have established a space force we, we are able to bring a little unity of effort across the department 
And I think that that is well solved by 2041 as well. And as I tell, tell our team, and I tell the team in the Department of Defense, uh, we want to be bold, we want to go fast, and we need to all be rolling in the same direction. We're already seeing the benefits of that by establishing a Space Force. And, and those two things, the bureaucracy piece and then building a light, lean, agile Space Force, purpose-built for space to be able to move at speed, to stay ahead of this threat, to compete, deter, largely to deter, uh, and win if deterrence were to fail is... Uh, um, something that we're focused on a lot. And I think over the next next couple of years, those pieces are, you know, they'll always, they're all, there'll always be work to do, but the big major muscle movements of that will be done. So we've got some fantastic questions um, from the online audience. Uh, one of the first of them was um, a reference to how you talked about the need to build uh, norms of behavior uh, in this space. And the questioner asks, um, given that, what are, I'm going to paraphrase, but um, uh, what space-based behavior is aggressive but benign and what crosses into that act of war? Um, we need to go back to your questions, Peter. <laughs> uh, these, are some, these are some really hard balls. Uh, the, the, the challenge with that is um, it's hard to tell. You know, so... So historically, for example, if you had a capability that you that you were going to launch that was going to do satellite servicing, let's say you wanted to go up and refuel a satellite on orbit, uh, the ability to refuel a satellite on orbit could be very benign. At the same time, if you have the ability to refuel a satellite, there's probably an aggressive tactic that could be taken uh, as well. And that's one of the challenges that we see in the domain is that as the domain is dual use, uh, a lot of the things that might, to some, be benign, taken another way, could be could be aggressive. And I, I think that's you've really hit on one of the key things that uh, uh, needs to be addressed as we talk about norms of behavior. Is that something that comes up in the? You talked about this important meeting of um, the different space leaders. Is that something that is um, being discussed right now, or is it something that we need to put on the agenda moving forward? We, we're we're talking a lot about North's behavior. In fact, our Secretary of Defense has recently written a memo that that outlined five, I think there's five different uh, standards of North's behavior that that, that we're going to follow. Um, we are working very closely with our international partners. Uh, to develop uh, the same, the, the same, you know, building on those, adopt those, and building on those inter with our international partners to to have a stronger voice together. Uh, U.S. is leading uh, in this business. The U.K. is is doing a lot of work as well with uh, with the United Nations uh, uh, on norms of behavior. It's 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 a topic of significant conversation, and it's it's a topic not just a conversation, but when we exercise together. And working together with our international partners, we're we're focusing a lot on on these exact issues. So one of the um, next questions is about a um, proposal, not yet uh, arguably a real technology that got a lot of attention. Um, it's the idea of uh, rocket delivered cargo. And uh, the questioner asks, um, the, given the Air Force's newest Vanguard program, how realistic is it for DOD to use space capabilities to deliver material? That's what the Vanguard is, at, is looking at. Uh, we, think, we think there's an opportunity there. Uh, the Vanguard will help, will help explore that, will help uh, uh, tease out some of the challenges and opportunities that are faced with that. Uh, but we think we think there's opportunities, and um, that's 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 why we stood up the Vanguard. Uh, I'm not I'm not here to tell you we think it's going to be easy, but we're hope, hoping that this Vanguard program can help us help us uh, uh, inform us on, on on how viable this might be going forward. How do you avoid the um, problem of uh, potential miscalculation by the um, target, so to speak, the adversary in that it's, it's a little bit of a parallel of um, how do I know the difference of um, it's the debates around hypersonics of something that's conventional nuclear coming at me. How do I, um, if I'm on the adversary side, know whether um, they're delivering a widget into the theater of operation versus a munition? 
Yeah, I think all those things are things that we're going to explore. I, I do. I agree with you. Those those are things that would, would have to be worked out. Those are things that will that can make it challenging. I think uh, attribution uh, is, is going to be something that we'll look at uh, uh, technology wise. Uh, do we think it's technology? It's achievable from a technology perspective at a cost that makes it makes it relevant, and then all the other policy issues that are associated with that, um, as you highlighted, will be will be things that we'll have to tease out. So another questioner um, asks, uh, "Quote with the importance of being able to fight Satcom." How are you working with industry to build out a multi-band, multi-orbit enterprise architecture? And in fact, um, you know, when we say fight SATCOM, what we mean by that is being able to operate satellite communications through a contested uh, environment. Our, our adversaries have uh, jamming capability to be able to jam uh, our communication satellites, uh, a significant amount of our communication satellites. And, and so our, when we say fight SATCOM, that's what we mean. How do we operate through that, that contested nature? Uh, we actually uh, published a vision uh, a year or so ago um, that, that we put out talking about the need to be able to do just as your questionnaire, the question answered uh, or asked. We worked that vision with commercial industry. We brought, we brought industry together. And, and you know, in, a, in my uh, mind, you know, when I fly to another country and I turn on my my iPhone, it automatically syncs up to whatever the network is in that country. Uh, and I remember, you know, I, I, I flew to a country and it and I landed and actually, as soon as it comes on, it says, welcome to whatever network it is. Uh, I, I left that country and went to another country and landed at that country and immediately on landing, turned my phone on and it says, welcome to this network. What we're trying to do is figure out how to, how to have a, a mesh, if you will, of communications that that allows you to sync up to whatever is uh, uh, most viable uh, based on the, the environment uh, that, that you're facing and to link up uh, with whatever works the best. And so that hybrid mesh network is something that I think is important. Uh, we've published the vision again, we helped industry helped us inform that vision. Uh, and now as we uh, continue to, to develop our communication programs, we'll continue to look to that vision as a, as a guiding, as a guiding uh, mechanism to, to build the capabilities we need to be able to, to achieve that end. So now we have a question about um, the, not just the opportunity, but the challenge that comes from um, so much being put into orbit. And uh, the question is, do you have interference concerns with the uh, thousands of satellites like SpaceX's Starlink satellites being inserted into low Earth orbit? Yeah, so we, you know, we act, the Space Force today acts as the space traffic control for the world. Uh, we, we, and it's interesting, we track about 30,000 objects uh, that, are, that are orbiting today. Um, uh, of those, you know, back, I use COVID, the start of COVID is a, is a kind of a time hack. Back when we first started wearing masks, uh, there was about 1,500 or so active satellites on orbit, something like that. It was a little over 1,500 satellites. The rest of all that was debris. Uh, today, um, the numbers of, of satellites that we're tracking are well over 4,000. And so we see a significant growth, and in, in Starlink is, is kind of the first out of the shoot maybe, but there's more coming. And there's, it's, they might they may not have even been the first. There's others that are up there, but but they're the biggest uh, so far, but there's more coming. And so we take about 400,000 observations a day of everything that's in space. We do all the analysis to determine if two things are gonna potentially uh, collide. Um, we warn the world if we see potential collisions and we tell somebody, hey, you better, might wanna consider moving uh, because uh, we don't wanna create more debris. In fact, I think it was 2008 when two satellites collided uh, that um, caused about 3,000 pieces of debris. And so that is becoming, a, it's a it's a full-time job uh, to keep that domain safe. Uh, and I think it's going to, it's going to uh, continue to, to increase. And I think, I think that really also then uh, uh, talks about the needs for, for uh, norms of behavior. I think it talks about um, debris mitigation steps. 
and people ask me all the time, how do you how do you solve the debris problem? But the way you solve the debris problem, at least initially, is don't create the debris in the first place. And, and, and you know, don't litter space when you launch a, a satellite with debris. Don't have two things collide. Have engineering standards that, that don't uh, um, cause satellites to break up at the end of their life and cause debris. And so all of those things on responsible use of, of space um, uh, and responsible behaviors in space are important. In fact, one of the one of the, the tenets that in the memo that Secretary Austin signed out on responsible behavior in space talks about uh, limiting the generation of long-lived debris. And so uh, it, it's something that we've, we're going to have to focus on. It's going to become um, even more of a challenge as we as we progress. So we have time for one last meaty question, and it's this uh, quote: "Strategists believe air power is inherently offensive." manifestly strategic and should be organized independently. Does the United States Space Force need a similar doctrine? We, have a, we, we actually took a uh, stab at writing a doctrine. And so, you know, when, this, when the Air Force stood up back in 1947, it had, it had come out of World War II and there was some air power theorists, if you will, that were at what was called the Air Corps Tactical School in Montgomery, Alabama, that were developing doctrine. And the doctrine at the time was daylight strategic bombing. And so uh, a group of, of guardians uh, got together on their own in, in about, I think it was about 25 of them, got together and wrote a doctrine called space power. Uh, you, can, you can get it online. Uh, um, and it, it was our attempt, our first attempt at putting out doctrine towards that end. It's actually really good. Uh, we've gotten really good reviews on it. We know it's not perfect, but we wanted to generate the, the debate and the dialogue, and I'd encourage people to read it and, and uh, uh, provide us their thoughts and inject, inject your thoughts into the conversation. So, General, I want to thank you um, both for uh, joining us. Uh, and helping us to launch this conference in a fantastic manner, but also want to thank you for your leadership uh, and all that you're doing to take Space Force into the future. Appreciate it. Peter, thank you. I, I really enjoyed the dialogue. I hope I hope we can meet up again. I, as I was thinking through the answers to the question, as, as I mentioned to you, questions, they, they were really thought-provoking. And uh, I'd love to continue a dialogue with you and, and whoever would like to, to to be part of that. I, I really appreciate it. And I thank you for the opportunity.